Hello there, my name is Fan Yang. Welcome to my CS5704 project video. Let me start off with a question. What goes through your mind when you think about complexity? If you're thinking about something like the intricate structures in biology, or vast social networks, or difficulties in predicting outcomes, you're absolutely on the right track. Complexity is a topic widely studied in the natural and social sciences, and so perhaps it's no surprise that it's found its way into Robert Glass's book, Facts and Fallacies of Software Engineering, published in 2002, wherein he discusses various topics related to software engineering. The last section in chapter one of the book is entitled Complexity, and in it, Glass makes a strong claim named Fact 21, about why it is difficult to find software solutions to complex problems. In this video, I will explore this claim in detail, which reads, for every 25% increase in problem complexity, there is a 100% increase in the complexity of the software solution. Here is fact 21 in its entirety. Glass makes the claim that I will just call the 25% 100% rule he goes on to say, that's not a condition to try to change. That's just the way it is. So strong is this assertion that Glass claims it can answer many difficult questions raised in software engineering, such as, why are people so important? And why does software have so many errors? To summarize the discussion in one sentence, it's all due to the complex nature of software engineering and this complexity is characterized by difficulties in predicting outcomes, achieving completeness, and finding globally optimal solutions. He goes on to say that if you remember nothing else from reading his book, just remember this fact, and that there are no silver bullets for overcoming this problem, because that's the nature of the beast. Fair enough. Let's dig deeper and try to understand why he thinks this is the nature of the beast. Thankfully, Glass provides strong references to back up his strong claims. The entire section cites a single paper published in 1979 by a young man named Scott Woodfield entitled An Experiment on Unit Increase in Problem Complexity. Today, he is Professor Woodfield at Brigham Young University, shown here. With a quick glance at the concluding sentence of this paper, we can immediately see that Fact 21 is almost a direct quote from it. Let me give you the executive summary of what he did. Woodfield starts off with an equation-based model that claims to relate problem complexity to programming complexity. These two concepts are encapsulated in mathematical expressions and related to each other in the form y is a function of x, where y is the programming complexity and x is the problem complexity. He shows that by increasing x by 25%, there will be a doubling of y. It's not exactly done like that, but it's close enough to give you an idea for now. I hear you objecting already. Surely this is not scientific. Anyone can make up an equation. We need evidence from say a lab experiment to see if the theory holds any water. That is precisely what Woodfield did. Since equations are so central to this publication, to truly understand what's going on, we need to know where he got them. For that, we must turn to the book Elements of Software Science, written by Maurice Halstead, published in 1977. This is one of the pioneering works in the field of software metrics. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a copy of this book for free and it proved to be somewhat pricey. So I'll briefly introduce his work using material from secondary sources. The context of this theory has to do with translating problems to programs. When we write code, we use operators and operands. Operands consist of variables, arguments, etc. While operators are symbols used to do things with operands. Some examples are shown here. The more complicated a problem is, the more operators and operands might be needed to program a solution. On the other hand, the higher level a language is, the fewer operators and operands we might expect to need. 
Halstead put forward a theoretical way of quantifying problem and program complexity in terms of operators and operands. When you think about an algorithm, the language used to implement it can only simplify it by so much. Suppose you had a language designed solely for a given problem, then even in this language, there has to be a minimum volume of symbols used to solve the problem. And that is roughly speaking, the number of unique operands described by the problem. This ideal volume of symbols called the minimum potential volume is what Halstead uses to measure problem complexity. Don't worry if this is a bit fuzzy, it will become clearer soon. Now, program complexity, on the other hand, can be empirically determined by reading someone's program and counting how many operators and operands they actually used. The truly interesting part of this theory is that given an algorithm, one can predict how large the implemented program will be. Let me rephrase that to emphasize how incredible that claim is. If I gave you an algorithm, can you conceive of a way to estimate how many lines of code somebody else might need to implement it? That is what this theory supposedly lets us do. If you are interested in the details, I would recommend checking out some of the references at the end of the video. So now that we kind of understand the theory, what was the experiment that Woodfield ran? The algorithm he used for his experiment was a random permutation generator for a fixed number of inputs. For example, if we used cards and fed this program three cards, we should get back a random permutation as shown. The minimum idealized volume for such a program will need four operands. That is three input variables for each card and one output list to be returned. If you recall from the explanation a minute ago, the problem complexity for this algorithm would have a measure of four. If we now have a program that takes four cards instead of three, the minimum number of unique operands increase from four to five, which is a 25% increase. This is where the first part of fact 21 comes from. Now, recall how the theory lets us predict the size of an implementation. Once you have this prediction, you can use it to compute related metrics. One such derived metric is something called effort, which is supposed to represent the cognitive effort imposed on the programmer. Woodfield was interested in the change in effort with respect to the change in inputs. And as you might have guessed, he showed that it doubled when we go from three inputs to four inputs. I'm not going to go into greater details, but you should know that by definition, effort is a function that grows quadratically with respect to program size. To summarize, before running the experiment, Woodfield used Halstead's theory to predict how big implementations would be. Then he got a bunch of grad students to implement both versions of this problem before counting the number of operators and operands they used to see how they changed. The analysis just involved checking if the observations matched up with the expectations, and they did. And this is how Woodfield empirically validated Halstead's theoretical model. So that's the quick and dirty summary of where this 25%, 100% rule came from. Let's go back and reflect on fact 21. I don't know about you, but I had several doubts and reservations on fact 21. Let's pause the video for a few seconds and see if we can think of any problems with the chain of arguments that I just presented. You might be asking, does fact 21 follow from Woodfield's experiment? Does Woodfield's experiment validate Halstead's theory? Okay, I will just list three exceptions that I took to the chain of arguments presented so far. The first problem I have is that I'm not sure that the concept of problem complexity is adequately captured by algorithms alone. If we are designing an operating system, for example, there is no algorithm to analyze. The second reservation I have is that the metric used in this experiment to represent program complexity was conveniently chosen to be non-linear. Something like program volume could just as easily been selected, and that would have grown linearly with respect to inputs. The third and biggest issue I have 
is with the use of software metrics as a proxy for cognitive effort. If we take the original experiment as an example, for me, the most difficult part would be implementing the baseline algorithm with three inputs. After that, I think it would be trivial for me to generalize it to four, or even 400 inputs. I think programming complexity needs to include the considerably higher cognitive price of designing and testing. There are also numerous academic critiques of Halstead's theory, which we don't have time to go into, but I will provide some links for those interested. So, what is the takeaway here? Given their shortcomings, should we discard FACT21 altogether? For me, I still find the spirit of FACT21 to hold. I don't think we need a theorem or even a quantitative argument to appreciate the complexity of software engineering. Glass was paraphrasing Frederick Brooks by saying, there is no silver bullet to subdue the beast. I would go one step further to say that we cannot even adequately describe the beast, at least not in the form of an equation. Now having said all this, Woodfield and Halstead's works were published over 40 years ago. Let me know in the comments if you are aware of any relevant bodies of work that have tried to do something in a similar spirit using modern techniques. I would also be curious to know what you think about the relationship between problem and program complexity in an increasingly complex world. Thank you for watching my presentation on Robert Glass's Fact 21 from his book, Facts and Fallacies of Software Engineering. I hope you enjoyed the content and I would love to hear your feedback on it. Until we meet again, take care.